songs and why do they deserve so much attention? And I'd encourage, and I'd say the same thing. I would say that it's to know, to seek, to feel, to seek, to know, to trust, and to rejoice. So let's unpack these. This book, the book of Psalms, sits somewhere in kind of an awkward place, to be honest. Um, it's smack dab in the middle of the Old Testament, and it's housed in the wisdom literature, which is where you get um, Ecclesiastes, where you get Song of Solomon, um, where you get Job, where you get Proverbs. And the psalm sits just between Job and Proverbs and is part of the very section that, that we find it in tonight. And psalms is more than just a collection of, of praises. This is God's inspired word. This is God's inspired word. It's no more, no less. It's God's word. So if these are God's words and this is the book of psalms, where do we, where do we find ourselves? Where do we find ourselves? What do we do with this? What do we do with this? So let's talk about the who. Who actually composed the Psalms? The Psalms were composed by seven different authors at least. And that's how we, that's how, and we can see that directly from the text. We see that David, King David, who united Judah and Jerusalem, he wrote one. Two, we also know that Solomon wrote two as well. Asaph wrote 12. The kings of Korah wrote 10. Moses, that we talked about tonight, we sang in Psalm 90, he wrote one, and then we have two Ezraites, Heman and Ethan, they each wrote one as well. So if you're calculating, I did the math for you, that's 48 Psalms that are not named. David wrote half of them, if I didn't mention that. David wrote 70, 75, so just about half of them. Or half of them. But the same themes still come across, to know, to seek, to trust, to rejoice, to feel. And what I want you to stress, what I want you to make sure that you get out of tonight is that we can still take the Psalms and read them, even though with seven authors, they, and they were developed across a thousand years, we can still take Psalms and read them as if they were written by the same triune God, which is, which is of course true. Each book that we talked about in Psalms as well is split up and was written across 300 different years. It was written across, um, initially, book one was written, you can think of book one as written across the first 300 years, book two, another set of 300 years, and so on and so forth. But the thing that is most clear, the thing that's most apparent is they're unified. They're not only unified, but they are God's word, and they have the same message. They're, re they're leading to the same point. So let's, let's, talk about, let's talk about book one, book one to feel. You may be like, you know, Michael, um, I, I, what do you mean by to feel? And, and here's what I mean. Book one encourages us to feel, and not just to feel anything, but to feel attention. And while it's true, right, it's true that as a human, as any person in this world, you have this ability to feel, um, it's calling, book one is calling you to do more than that. It's that the world is not right. There's a cat, there's, there's a split. There's Righteousness and there's wickedness and there's a tension, right? Because they both coexist. There's a tension between God and not God, between godly and not godly, between those that follow God and those that don't follow God. And it's there. It's not going away. They both exist in kind of a dual space. And this, this tension is really just called life. And it's broken. I mean, this is kind of what we talked about in Ecclesiastes. We talked about this whole idea that life is broken, yet there is a better way. There is God's way. And that's what we're really picking up upon in book one. So let's open to Psalm, uh, Psalm 1. Um, I'm going to read Psalm 1, first couple of verses. Psalm 1. How happy is the man who does not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path of sinners or join a group of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. He is like a tree planted beside streams of water that bears fruit in due season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. And that's, that's, how, that's how the book of Psalms opens up. You, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, they kind of split up and present two different paths. You either have God's way, which we just read, and then Psalm 2. Um, I'm going to read Psalm 2 um, in, in verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rebel and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and their rulers conspire against one another. Let us tear off their chains and free ourselves from their restraints. 
So we get a picture of Psalm 1, Psalm 2. You have this idea of God's way, following God's instruction, and then you have this other, this other way, which is not God's way, which is following your own heart, which is following your own desires. And that kind of lays the foundation because throughout the book we see this tension. We see this idea of, hey, God, God has a way. God's way is the right way. And then we also see, oh, we've got people that are following their own hearts, following their own minds, going their own ways. <sighs> and it's tough. There's, a, there's, there's tension here. Um, there's tension, and it's not going away. There's a broken, broken world out there, and that's, what, that's kind of, that lays the ground for where we're at. So before we get to the rest of Psalm 1, I want you to know that God, God wants you to feel. God wants you to feel this tension as you're walking through the Psalms. God wants you to feel this tension as you're walking through in life. He gave you emotions to glorify him. And they weren't just emotions for you to keep to yourself, but he gave you emotions for you to feel and to know that something is wrong. He wants you to grasp the world around you and to observe and, and to guard your heart. And that's tough. Everybody has something on their hearts. Everybody has something that they're struggling with, something that they see that they just can't get rid of, yet God calls you to live in this circumstance. How does, how, does God, how, does God, how does God encourage you through this? Let's, let's, let's continue. Psalm 3.1. Psalm 3.1 tells us that even as tension is mounting, Lord, my foes increase, there are many who attack me. The psalmist feels it. Psalm 4.4. 4, God wants you to be angry and not to sin. 4.4 4 says, be angry and do not sin on your bed, reflecting your heart and be still. Be affirmed that there are certain times in life when you should get upset. There are certain times when you see sin, when you see something that bothers you, and you should be floored. And what is the psalmist doing? The psalmist is expressing it. The psalmist is, 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 is hearing um, what's going on around him. He's seeing what's going on around him, and he's troubled. He's troubled. When something is wrong, godly people respond. They're not silent. They don't let bones, they don't let their bones rot, as in Psalm 32, 3. They respond. If you see someone godly and they're upset and you're not, you might want to be concerned. Psalm, the book of Psalms, or book one in Psalms, is emotional. You see godly people upset. You see people that are watching wicked people get away with craziness. No emotion, no tension is wasted. God can even use that. So if we stand in this tension, what do we do? What do we do? We keep going. We keep going. We see in, in, in Psalm 6, 4, turn, Lord, rescue me, save me because of your faithful love. We cry out to God. We move. We're moved. We don't just see sin. We don't just feel sin. We move. We respond. And it's godly. It's godly to cry out to God. It's godly to say, hey, this sucks, and I don't understand it. And I felt that myself as, as, as I was preparing for, for, for tonight and as I've been praying, preparing for the last few weeks, they've been draining for me. They've been absolutely draining. And my, my circumstances have pushed me. They forced me to to be honest with God, this is something that I'm, that I'm struggling with. This is something that is paining me. This is something that I see that's just not right. God wants you to move forward, but God also wants you to be thankful. Psalm uh, 7, 12 says this. If anyone does not repent, God will sharpen his sword. He has strung his bow and made it ready. God does not want you to just look at sin and see it. God just doesn't want you to look at sin and turn away from it. God wants you to be thankful. God wants to even use your tiredness and, your, and the wickedness that he sees in the world for his glory. Think about all the literal quotes you see in the Psalms. Think about them. There's quotes everywhere. 
God's people are paying attention. God's people are seeing the world as it is, and they are responding. God doesn't call you to to live a life of numbness. God calls you to live a life of engagement. Psalm 12.1 says this. Help, Lord, for no faithful one remains. The loyal have disappeared from the human race. The psalmist is troubled. There's anxiety. There's agony. Psalm 13.2. How long will I store up anxious concerns within me? Agony in my mind every day. How long will my enemy dominate me? A little bit later in Psalm 14, 6, sinners frustrate the plans, the plans, the plans of the wicked. Sinners frustrate the plans of the afflicted, but the Lord is his refuge. There's evil all around us. And we can't just retreat. We can't scrunch back. We can't ignore it as if it's not there. We can't just say, oh, I've got my, 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 my Christian bubble of theology and I'm going to be okay. No, God calls you to respond. And God is calling you to, to be moved. God is calling to get on your knees. Psalm 18, 6. I called to the Lord in my distress, and I cried out to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry to him reached his ears. The next question you might be asking is, why is God, why is God allowing this? What am I supposed to do with this? Why am I moved? Is it just the dire circumstances? Is it just the preferred alternative to not be moved? What do I do? Friends, there's a better way, but God's way is not just a better way. It's the best way. It's the way that the world was intended to be. And that's why there's this tension, right? You have this whatever is going on over here that's bothering you, and then you have God's way. You know it's not supposed to be that way. Look at, look at, look at Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Psalm 19 is really God's testimony. It's God's um, it's nature's testimony of, of, of God himself and God's way. And nature even testifies to the glory, to the truth of the Lord. Look, the heavens declare the glory of, of the Lord, verse 1, and the sky proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There is no words. Their message has gone out to all the earth, and the words to the ends of the world. Psalm 19 testifies that even nature itself affirms and celebrates God's glory. The skies, the days, the nights, all of them respond to God's way. Book one calls you to lean in. Book one calls you to feel. Book one calls you to feel this tension almost like a game of tug of war where nobody is winning. So let's look at what God's, let's look at, let's look at what wickedness, let's look at what man's way is pitted against, which is God's way. What are the psalmists trying to get us to see? God's way is the same word, funny enough, found in Isaiah 55. God's way is, is direct. God's way is distinct. God's way belongs to him. God's way, God's way is perfect. God's way is infallible. God's way is different. God's way is contrasting. God's word is strong. God's word is reliable. Let's look at Psalm 21.1. Lord, the king finds joy in your strength. How greatly he rejoices in your victory. Even the king, right? The top of the food pyramid at the top of the hierarchy contrast. He finds hope. He relies on God's word. And it's contrasted because it makes you recognize that you're, that you're weak. It makes you recognize that God's word is strong. It makes you recognize that you need him. 
And that's the tension that we feel. That's the tension that we feel. Psalm 23, probably the, the most famous of the Psalms. Um, you know, even non-Christians know, know Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What does Psalm 23 say? Psalm 23, look at verse 2. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me along the right paths for his name's sake. God's word is dependable. God's word is impenetrable. God's word is God's word and it's perfect. Look at Psalm 26, 8. Look at Psalm 27, 4. God's word is consistent with God's glory. God's word is true. God's word is perfect. I mean, Psalm 27 is, it gets one of my favorite songs. Um, one thing that I desire of the Lord and that will I seek after. Um, man. God's word, God's way is so different, so holy, right? That's where, the, that's where the word holy comes from. It's so different from the rest of everything else. Yet, God's will exists, God's word, God exists, God's way exists, even amidst the wickedness that we see in the world. What a contrast we have. What a contrast we have between sin and God's wickedness. There's a pull of evil, yet there's God's way. And God's way is not just better, it's best. And God calls us to live, to live in this space, to live in this space where you have wickedness and righteousness, wickedness and ratchetness. Like, it's all there, and it's like, ugh. Where do you turn? So if book one is calling you to, to feel, to live in that tension, book two is definitely calling you to seek God, to seek God. You understand that there is a contrast. You understand that there's an imbalance. You understand that you need God's protection. You understand that you need God's forgiveness. And you have to progress. You have to move forward. Look at Psalm 31, Psalm 32, Psalm 34, Psalm 35. They are all leading us to seek God. We've got to seek God. We can't just live in this space and be numb. We're called to respond, and so we're called to seek God, and that's really, that's what book two does. Book two encourages you to drive yourself to God. Book two opens up. Look at verse, look at uh, Psalm 42. As a deer pants for the streams, so I long for you. This, is, this was written by the sons of Korah. And the sons of Korah, they, they desire, they want God. And God wants you to want him. You see similar language in uh, Psalm 63, when David says he thirsts and his body even faints for the Lord in verse 1. This is, this is the posture we've got to have. This is where we have to approach God. We approach God feeling, knowing how the world is, and we approach God knowing that we need to worship him. Think about it, friends. God doesn't need you, but he wants you to worship him. He wants you to live in this tension and not just to say, oh, kind of, you know, this too shall pass and I'll be okay. God wants you to live and have a posture of dependency. You already know that God can, can, can use, and use anything and anyone. I mean, think about the donkey in Numbers 22. You think about um, in Luke 19, you think about rocks will even cry out for God if, if need be. God wants you to posture your heart. God wants you to approach him with humility. And God wants you to see that you need him. Look at Psalm 44. Uh, verses 23 through 27. Wake up, Lord. Why are you sleeping? Get up. Don't reject us forever. Why do you hide yourself and forget our affliction and oppression? 
for we have sunk down to the dust. Our bodies cling to the ground. Rise up, help us, redeem us because of your faithful love. These verses call us to respond quickly, to awake, to rise up, to do something, to seek the Lord. Psalmist wants you to seek the face of God. And what's beautiful is the sons of Korah, who wrote a number of these here in this section, they were not too proud, not too proud to beg and ask God for what they needed and to recognize that they needed him. Is there a better position to be in than to be a beggar for God? Is there? So many of us won't do that. So many of us won't get on our knees and beg God. We see all this tension. We know that things are wrong. We see people that are suffering. We see people that are hurting. And we know that God can, or we at least say that God can. And we won't run to the Lord. God wants you to be a dependent beggar. God wants you to be dependent. He wants you to be needy. He wants you to get on your knees. He wants you to ask him for what you need. God doesn't want you to just feel and live in anxiety land or agony or stress or whatever you might be going through. God wants you to drop to your knees. God wants you to submit to him. God wants you to see that he's in control and God wants you to be desperate for him. If the ground is, is crumbling, God wants you to crumble in his hands. And that's, that's what book two is all about. Book two is all about God encouraging you to seek him. And think again, these are words from a sinner to our savior. These are words from a sinner to the perfect God. We have this tension, right? And within that tension, we are to seek and we are to go to God. No excuses. Look, just, just, I, I'm going to blur through these really, really quickly. Psalm 54.1, 51.1, 56.1, 57.1, and 61. I'm going to read them to you. I just want you to know where they're coming from. This is, if you were to put the first verse of each one of those chapters together, this is what you would hear. Save me, vindicate me, listen to me, be gracious to me, be gracious to me, deliver me, hear my cry. Psalm, book two in Psalms, is about you seeking God. Make no mistake about that. Make no mistake about that. Think about, look at Psalm, look at Psalm 51 and specifically. Everyone's familiar, or most people are familiar with Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is where David was confronted by Nathan. And he pleads, this is, this, here, the, here, here, here are the highlights out of this. Be gracious, cleanse, purify, restore, save me. All in the same chapter. God wants you to seek him. God didn't place you in a circumstance just for you to feel, just for you to know that something's wrong. God placed you to be in your circumstance to call out to him. Why won't we seek him? Why? God wants to hear from you. God wants to share in your struggle. Yes, God is a therapist, but make no mistake, God is a counselor. God understands you, God understands your situation, and that's why he gave you the Psalms. God knows what's not just better, God knows what's best. And this is, this is crazy when you think about it. God, God gave you words that you can use, and they're not words that are catching him by surprise. They're not words that are for you to just kind of let sit in your Bible. They're words for you to pair it back to God. He made these words. He gave us these words, and they're for us. He identifies what we're going through. He understands. He understands this tension that you're feeling. And he knows what you're bearing. Look at Psalm 69. Psalm 69. Still almost, almost the end of book two here. Psalm 69. 
Save me, Psalm 69, 1. Save me, God, for the water has risen to my neck. What a line. Save me, Lord, because the water has risen to my neck. Has anybody ever felt like water was rising around you and there was no physical puddle anywhere near you? Verse 2, I'm weary from crying. My eyes fail looking to God. Verse 5, you know my foolishness. I mean, this is a line. You know my foolishness and my guilty acts, and they're not hidden from you. Don't let me sink. Friends, this tension, if you haven't figured it out, it's not just from other people. It's, it's from you. You're part of the problem. And what we see here is, this is very personal. This is, is a literary masterpiece. And I think it, what I've, as, as, a, as I studied book two in particular, I thought it was just, what struck out to me was the fact that this is the perfect book to be reading during quarantine. This is the perfect book of the Bible to be focusing on because it reaffirms that we need fellowship with God. It reaffirms that God should be the most intimate person that we are in relationship with. And, and it was convicting because it reminded me is, it's not him that's, it's not God that's not available, it's me. You know, forced to socially exist in and be, you know, 12 chairs away from, from, from people and not be able to show up and not be able to go out. It reminded me, my most important relationship is right here, wherever I go, because God is with me. God is with you. God is available. Why are we not available? God's relational. He loves for you to be weak. He loves for others to be weak, and he loves for us to depend on him. What are those things that quarantine made you put down? What are those things that quarantine made you address? What are those things that you still, knowing the tension, knowing your own sin, knowing the sin of others, what are those things that you won't bring to God? When's the last time you came to him honestly? To seek him, knowing that this tension exists. When's the last time you've come to talk to him? When's the last time you've come to, direct, to be direct and to be honest with him? God is available and you're the one that's tired. You're the one that's too busy. God's not. And he's interested in having a regular. He's interested in having a heartfelt. He's interested in having an honest conversation with you college students. As you get ready to go to college and, you know, you're going away, yet you'll still be away from other people to some extent with this bubble mentality. Remember that God is there and God wants you to seek him. That's what book two is all about. God wants you to seek him. Praying with others is fine. Being in community and, and fellowship, I know we're all hungry for that. But more than that, go to God. And that's, 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 what book two, that's what book two's theme is. So book one teaches you to feel, to grapple, to, to understand this tension. And book two encourages you to seek God, um, who can identify and, and understand your struggle. Book three really is about reassuring you that God can. Book three is about requesting that you know God. He's the one to run to, so right? By now, somebody should probably be asking me, all right, well, Michael, so uh, book one says to feel God. Book two says I need to seek God. Book three says I need to know God. How is it, and we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, how is it? that God's way is the best way and God still allows not God's way to persist, to persist and to pervade in the world. I mean, we saw the psalmists earlier, they're complaining, they're saying, hey, there are people literally getting, literally and figuratively getting away with murder. Doesn't God care? Doesn't God know? Doesn't God want to respond? How do I know? 
I think this is, this is the question. How do I know that I'm going to end up better than those that don't know God? Book three, Psalms 73 through 89, which were written mainly by, by Asaph, um, who's a Levitical priest, encourages us that God is the one to know and that God is at work. Psalm 73, verse 1. I'm going to read uh, the first 12 verses here. God is indeed good to Israel, to the pure in heart. But as for me, my feet almost slipped. My steps nearly went astray. For I envied the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have an easy time until they die, and their bodies are well fed. They are not in trouble like others. They are not afflicted like most people. Therefore, pride is their necklace, and violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge out from fatness. Their imaginations of their hearts run wild. They mock, and they speak maliciously. They arrogantly threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven, and their tongues strut across the earth. Therefore, his people turn to him and drink in their overflowing words. The wicked say, how can I know God? Does the Most High know anything? Look at him, the wicked. They are always at ease and they increase their wealth. Does that make anybody else just sick? And friends, it's, it's important to, to, as book three reminds us, for us to know God and to know that God is in control and that God is working. An end is coming. Everyone dies and everyone will be called to account for what they did in the flesh. If God can't answer for you, you're through. Christians, we have to know God because we have to be able to cling to his promises. Even though it may seem like the world is just going on and on and there may not be a resolution in sight, we have to be reminded that God is at work. God sees this. God knows this tension. And God is patient. God is kind. God is gracious. And while this is happening, we should be clinging to God's promises. We should be seeking him. Evildoers, we have to remember, are kind of like one-hit wonders, right? Here with one song and gone the next. How easy it is for us not to focus on, for us not to pay God the attention that he deserves. Can you, let me just, just think about this, right? To take care of this just a little bit further. Anybody remember the songs Rude and Gangnam Style? Like, does anybody even remember who actually sang those songs? I didn't. I looked. I couldn't figure them out. And I mean, everybody knows those words. They couldn't remember the author, but I couldn't remember, I couldn't remember the, the singers. God is not ignoring words and deeds. Yes, they may seem like they are extended play, one-hit wonders, but the tension that, that God calls us to, to hear, to feel, to hear, to sense, Remember that God is patient. Remember that God sees these things and God is responding. He is not sleep. He does not slumber. He is not ignoring. He feels and sees and knows the very same things that you're experiencing and he wants you to seek him and he wants you to know him. Let's look at 74 verse, verse, uh, verse 11 here. Chapter 74 verse 11 says this, why do you hold back your hand, stretch out your right hand and destroy them? 7412, God, my king is from ancient times, performing saving acts on the earth. We see in the same chapter, despite the fact that people think that God is not at work and God doesn't exist, the fool says in his heart that God is not there Psalm 74 drives us and reminds us that God is working. We may not be able to see him, but God is working. 13, keep looking at the progression. You divided the sea with your strength. You smashed the heads of the sea monsters in the water. You crushed the heads of the Leviathan. You fed him to the creatures of the desert. God is an actor. 
God is always present and always active in the world. We talked about this in Psalm 19. Even nature is responding, right? Nature, sun, moon, stars, days, boundaries, seasons. God is at work even when we can't see him. And God doesn't expect for you to turn to yourself and say, oh, let me wring my hands. I'm just, I'm just going to kind of deal with this. God doesn't call you to live numb to what's going on around you. God doesn't call you to be unresponsive to the world around you. God listens and God wants you to cry out to him. So knowing God, what do we do? If he's, if he's patient, the question that any non-Christian should be asking or maybe even you might be asking yourself is, can I just repent later? Can I just continue going down the way that I want to go down? Can I just take the shortcut and sin now and ask for forgiveness later? If God is patient, what do I need to be doing now? Can't I just ask him for forgiveness later? And this is the question that Paul asked in Romans 6, 1, right? And, and the resounding answer is no. No, that's not taking God's word. You don't know God if you can do that. That's taking God for granted. It's taking your relationship for granted with him. It is despicable. And we can't claim to know God if that's the case. I know this might sound harsh. I know you might be saying, well, Michael, you know, it's just a little bit. It's just, yeah, no. There's a war out here. There is tension out here, and you cannot ignore it. God's holiness is not malleable to your circumstances. Knowing what we know, knowing who God is, we continue the course. We continue to be obedient. We continue to read God's word. We continue to feel the tension. We continue to seek him. Even when it feels like nobody is looking or we may not get the reward that we want. So not only are we, dis not only are we obedient, we are also communicative and we are as we know God, we are communicating God to other people. Look at Psalm 78. Psalm 78, verses 3 through 4. Things we have heard and known and that our fathers have passed down to us, we must not hide them from their children, but must tell a future generation the praises of the Lord, his might and the wonderful works he has performed. God calls us to testify. God calls us to tell another generation, those coming in faith behind us, we are to tell them about the Lord. Why? Because we feel this tension and we know him. It's kind of like the sun, right? The sun generates all of this heat in one space and then its rays push out. Similarly, as a Christian, right, we seek God and what God does in our heart comes out and we tell others about the Lord. When's the last time you've done that? There's no such thing as an island Christian. I love these, I love these not Christians, I love these people that come out and say, hey, you know, I, I love the Lord and I'm doing X, Y, and Z. And I say, oh, that's awesome. And, and you know, what does your community look like? Oh, no, I, I, ju I just follow the Lord by my, myself. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Psalm 78 tells us that we are, it commands us that we are to be telling future generations. Unless you're in solitary confinement, and even then, we can church and still not be in a and, and not and not be in a building, but we can still be in community with one another. Quarantine proved that. And that's what I don't want you to, to miss, because to know God, you know that God is working supernaturally in your heart so that you can tell other people about him. God is working supernaturally in your mind so that you can think the thoughts of him. God is working supernaturally in your life so that you can respond appropriately. And start with yourself, right? So knowing God, let God's words become your words through, this, through songs and poetry. Talk about, sing about, praise about the one you know. I was talking to my cousin the other day, and uh, 
we were talking about the Lord and what the Lord had been doing in her life, and she was talking to me about her daughter. She's a little bit older than me. I've come from a big family. And she uh, was telling me, she was like, yeah, I was telling my daughter about the Lord and what he'd been doing and how I've been starting to pick up and read my Bible again. And she said, oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not interested. Good for you, but not interested. And I said, you know what? There's, there's my sermon illustration right there. Here we have someone that knows God and what is coming out of their heart. They're just telling, they're just telling friends and family what they already know. No magic formula. Telling what the Lord has done in her own heart, in her own mind, in her own soul, and it just naturally welled out. Whether we realize it or not, we are always, always, always communicating our knowledge or lack of knowledge about the Lord and how we relate to him and others. The simple definition for that is it's called your witness. And so you're probably thinking, right, we've gone through the first, we've gone through three books now. We've the book one called us to, to know, or excuse me, book one called us to uh, feel, book two called us to know, book three caused us to seek, and now book three, you're probably, or book four, you're like, well, what are we going to do with the rest of the four books? Isn't that like the gospel? And I tell you, not quite, almost there, almost there. Book three impressed upon our, uh, book three pressed upon us our need to know God, and book four, um, I, I think there's a slight difference. Book four is, is pressing upon our need to trust God. And you're probably thinking, all right, well, what's the difference between knowing and trusting? And I think the, 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 the inspired compiler, right? So the book, um, the uh, book four was, or all the books were, ins- were compiled by a set, by either Ezra himself or by um, uh, a group of Levitical priests during the same time after the Babylonian exile. And so book four is calling us to trust. And there's a difference. And here's, here's how I would, I think the Bible is full of amazing illustrations. And I, and I look at Job to, to, get, to get this. Um, Job 42.5 says this, My eyes have heard of you, but now my eyes, my ears have heard of you, but my eyes have seen you. And, and that'd be the same way I'd like in knowing to trusting. Knowing, having a knowledge of God, trust, applying that. So uh, book four, uh, Psalms 90 through 106, invites you to take your knowledge of God and to trust him and to know that that is the only source, the only way, the only resolution that we have in life to deal with this tension. We need to really know God and we need to trust him. And that's what the Israelites did is they progressively went through history. They built and they banked their hope in, in the Lord and what he, and what he was doing. Um, book four calls us to, to really stop for a minute and to think, what does it mean for me to trust God? What does it mean for me to trust the ancient of days? And I think there are two aspects within book four that are really highlighted that help us to trust God. First is, is God's eternality. It's God's timelessness. Look at Psalm 90. This is the one that we read um, earlier, that Dan read earlier for us, um, that was written by Moses. Lord, you have been our refuge in every generation. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from eternity to eternity, you are God. God's been working. Verse 4 there, for in your sight a thousand years are like yesterday that passes by, like a few hours of the night. God is outside of time. So God is not just eternal, but God is outside of time, and he's not bound by it. God is forever, and he's before time. There's no jet lag. There's no fast-forwarding. There's no, hey, let me catch up to see what Michael's up to today. Like, no, God is outside of time, and it doesn't phase, doesn't phase us. I mean, it doesn't phase him like it phases us. God numbers, literally numbers. <laughs> Why? The question that, you, that I think you should be asking now is if, 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 if the Israelites knew that they had, they felt this tension, they knew that they had to 
seek God and they knew and they knew of God, why was it so hard to trust? Shouldn't, if I know God, shouldn't it just be so easy to trust him? And I think um, that's a good question to ask. I think um, what the Israelites learned, what the Israelites knew that they ended up having to do was they had to remind themselves of who God was because in the crazy world of distractions, if you don't, you'll be tempted to forget. You'll be tempted to forget what you know. And I think that was, that, was, that was their stumbling block because, right, we talked about earlier, they knew that God wasn't sleep. They knew that God didn't slumber. They knew that God would, would redeem them. They, he knew, we knew that God was coming. Look at Psalm 92, 2. Or Psalm, I'll start in verse 1. 92, Psalm 92. It is good to praise Yahweh, to sing praise to your name, most high to declare your faithful love in the morning and your faithfulness at, light, at night. Look at that. To declare your faithful love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. Day and night, they had to remind themselves of God's faithfulness. Not just that God existed from from eternity past to eternity future, they had to remind themselves that God was faithful day and night on the same day. I know a lot of y'all is like me, forgetful. Right here, God knew that we would be forgetful. The Israelites knew that they were forgetful. Look at 94, um, Psalm 94, 1 through 2. Lord, God of vengeance, God of vengeance, appear. Rise up, judge of the earth. Repay the proud what they deserve. How could they know that and be disobedient? The same way we can know what we know about God and be disobedient. We don't trust God in that moment. We don't trust God in multiple moments, and we sin. And we contribute to the same tension that we want to get out of. Verses 8 through 11 of, of 94 as well. Pay attention, you stupid people. Fools, when will you be wise? Can the one who shaped the ear not hear? The one who formed the, e the eye not see? The one who instructs nations? The one who teaches man knowledge? Does he not discipline? The Lord knows man's thoughts. They are meaningless. God even knows the things that you don't say. How could the Israelites be confident in God's vengeance, yet still trust in him for their redemption? They knew of God. They knew of God, but they didn't trust him. And all of history, all of history is working towards, towards redemption. Praise the Lord that we don't have to sit in this tension. All of history is working towards the birth, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, remember at this point, the Israelites had Genesis 3. They had Genesis 3.15 at this point. They knew that God was going to send his Messiah. They knew that God was going to send his son. Yet they sinned. We sin. Why? It's because we might know of God, but we're not trusting him. I mean, even within the Psalms, if you look at it, we, 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 we blew past this earlier, but Psalm 2, 7, you are my son today, I have become your father. Psalm 89, 27, I will make him my firstborn, the greatest of the kings of the earth. There were moments when they declared that they knew of God. They knew that his son was coming. They had glimpses of his son was coming. And they didn't trust him. God is eternal. God is faithful. And similarly, God sent an eternal and faithful promise to come and finally cut the tension that we're feeling. Without him, without knowing God, what promises do we have to cling to? 
Book four is reminding you, book four is begging you to trust God. Psalm 103.3 reads, He forgives all your sin. He heals all your diseases. Again, truth. Again, redemption. Again, trusting that God was going to bring redemption. Yet, it never does you any good to have the sheet music if you never sing. Without God, we have nowhere to place our hope. Without God, we have nowhere to turn. We have to live and we have to die with this tension. With Christ, everything is finally solved. But without Christ, nothing is solved. We have no place for hope, no place for forgiveness. And the Israelites had to long, they had to wait for this final redemption. And the sad part is they never saw it. They had God's word, but they don't have, they don't have, they're not in 2020 to 22,000 years beyond Jesus's, Jesus's life, death, burial, and resurrection. Psalm 110 is as close as they got. Psalm 110, 5 which I know is book five, but I'll just, I'll read a little bit of that for you. Psalm 110, verse five. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his anger. Psalm 110 is, is probably, I think, in, in my, in, in, not probably, yeah, probably, is the most messianic in my mind of, 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 of the Psalms that, that we haven't covered so far. Um, and it's as close as the Israel, Israelites got. Psalm 2, 7, Psalm 89, and Psalm uh, 110. As close as, close as the Israelites got. They welcomed the Messiah from afar. Yet, they were keenly aware, acutely aware of their sin. Psalm 51 we covered earlier. Psalm 40. Note that even though God required sacrifices, they had to continue to do it. They had to continue to do it over and over and over and over again. And they still had this tension. Many, think about this. This is scary to think about. Many feel this tension. Many seek God. Many know God but don't trust him. And, and here's the, the dangerous part, I think and the risk for, for us today. They stop short. You know, uh, they'll say, hey, I will do my quiet time today, but I won't meditate on God's word. I'll go through the motion of it. I'll show up for church today. I'll volunteer, but don't ask me to confess anything. I'll do whatever going through the motions is and not trust God. Have knowledge of God and not trust him. Friend, I'm telling you, place your hope, place your, your life in the hands of Christ. You have a very tangible, a very real, a very loving Savior that wants you to find forgiveness in him. And it's only found in his son. Only. Nothing else. So let's look at book number five. Book number five. Book number five calls us to rejoice. So book one tells us that we are to feel. Book two tells us that we are to know. Book, or book two tells us that we are to, to seek. Book three tells us that we are to know. Book four tells us that we are to trust. Book five tells us that we are to rejoice. And it is fitting because this is the largest of the books, right? 107 to, to 150. And God wants us to praise, and he wants us to praise because he commands it. Everything, every one, every moment, all, all should be praising God. And that's what he's revealed in his word. That's what this book is about. God gives us 150 psalms so that we will find 150 and more reasons to praise him. 
God wants you to inexhaustibly praise him. He knows that we're forgetful like the Israelites. He gave you literal words that you can say to him. Think about it. You know, I talked about music at the beginning. Psalms should be the, some of the easiest verses to memorize just because of the way your brain connects to that. God did not forget. God did not God did not forget how our brains worked. That's why he gave us the Psalms. Let's look at let's look at uh, verse or let's look at Psalm one thirteen. Psalm one thirteen. Hallelujah! Give praise, servants of Yahweh. Praise the name of Yahweh. Psalm one fourteen. When Israel came out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people who spoke a foreign language, Judah became his sanctuary. Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled. What a line! The sea looked and fled. Everything, 107 through 150, everything is praising the Lord. Not just people, but God's creation. All of God's creation is, is praising the Lord. And that's what, this, is, that's what this, this last book is about. What is here or what is in the book of Psalms are things you cannot even say or write without singing them. Dan was super kind to, uh, Dan and the band was super kind to play Psalm 34 um, tonight for um, worship. I love that song. That's, that's, that's been the psalm of my heart for the last four months in quarantine or five months or however long it's been. And God knew that. God knew that we needed a psalms like that to sustain us. I mean, for me, God knew it so much that I was playing it on repeat, and Jenny sent me a text with that very same song, the same time I was listening to it all day. We are built to rejoice in God, and, and book five makes that clear. God calls us to rejoice in him. God calls us to rejoice in what he's doing. Um, God calls us to rejoice in his faithfulness, and God calls us to rejoice in his excellency. Attributes of God, that's how, attributes of God, that is how the Israelites were able to trust God. They kept their minds focused on him. We need to rejoice in every aspect of God. Otherwise, we're prone to forget. God is incomparable. God is holy. God is magnificent. God is glorious. Psalm 115, 1. Not to us, Yahweh, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your faithful love, because of your truth. God is so unlike anything that you could compare him to. Psalm 115, Psalm 135, they, they, they emphasize God's otherness. They emphasize his holiness. And why is it repeated? It's repeated so that you wouldn't forget it. We know that we need redemption in Psalms. There's a forward-looking component to it, too. What the Israelites said, or what the Israelites said to God, God's attributes became their words. God's words became their heartbeats, despite what they saw. Life, as you know, life is messy. Life will get you down. But God's words are true. God's words are unchanging. God's words are your heartbeats. They're intended to be for you. And how do we know that God's word is, is made complete in us when we rejoice? Why, why even think that way, we read his word. Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119. How, how, does, how does Psalm 119 describe God's word? In verse 86, we see that God's word is true. In verse 89, we see that God's word is forever. In verse 138, we see that God's word is righteous. In verse 140, we see that God's word is pure. In verse 151, we see that God's word is true again. And in verse 160, we see that God's word is truth. 
do you see the word as all these things? If I saw the word as all these things, I would read my Bible a lot more. I hope if you saw the word as all these things that you would do the same. Psalm 119 should really cause us to to think about what do we actually believe about God's word? We, We claim to know a lot of stuff about God, but then the things that we do, the things that we say, suggest that that's not really who we trust in. The last, five, the last five chapters of, of, of Psalm 145 through 150, they're kind of like the grand finale. They're like the fireworks. Um, they could really kind of form, form a, a separate introduction similar to Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. Remember Psalm 1 and Psalm 2, they were, here's God's way, here's not God's way, here's righteousness, here's, righteousness, here's, here's unrighteousness. Psalms 145 through 50 are kind of a grand doxology. Um, Flip to 145. Psalm 145, verse 21. My mouth will declare Yahweh's praise. Let every living thing praise his holy name forever. What is the purpose of of Psalms? What, What is Psalms trying to get you to do? Psalms is trying to get you to relate to God through poetry and song to the world, and to him. They really, uh, Psalms 145, 46 um, through, through um, 150, it really just echoes what we've already been talking about. It encourages the reader to, to proclaim God's goodness, God's greatness across generations. Um, and what I think is kind of funny is if you look at it too, um, it kind of follows the same pattern that we, talk, that we talked about earlier calls for God in 145, calls for us to feel, calls for us to seek, calls for us to know, calls for us to trust, and it calls for us to praise. Given what we know about God, we should have no problems praising him. We seek, we know, we trust, we rejoice. And frankly, is given, what, given who God is, is there, is there a more fitting response? Dan initially thought it might be fitting for me to close this in a worship song. Um, I said, Dan, you obviously don't and have not heard my voice because that would, that's not a good idea. But I told him I have, I have praises but not to lead you in a song. Instead, you'll get a, a bedtime story, hopefully one that won't put you to sleep. Um, when I was in high school, my dad was teaching me to drive a manual car. You know, a car with a manual transmission, not one that you put P-R-N-D-L, but one where you actually have to row the gears yourself. And imagine, imagine that, right? For, I know some, we got some uh, folks that are just getting out of high school and they have like, what do you mean? All cars, all cars don't just shift the gears themselves? No, man. The D on the, the D in the, in the, in the uh, gear shifter, that's reminding you that, hey, you used to have to do it yourself. Um, but at any rate, I was really scared. And I was, I, was, I was really anxious, and I was trying to do the right thing and learn how to shift these gears. And it was complex and, un- and, and really unapproachable. And, and what's, what's more to that, remember at the beginning I said, hey, I, I used to love to race, I still do, love to race cars and play with Hot Wheels and Matchboxes on the floor. Like, that was my life. And so getting a chance to drive and learning how to do manual, um, a manual transmission car, I was so excited. Well, you know, I started to get the hang of it. It's like one to two and three to two to four and, you know. Um, and there's a clutch as well, right? So there's not just three pedals, but there's, there's not just two pedals, there's three. Um, and similarly, I, I kind of thought as I was thinking about the Psalms, that was the image that I got about how the Psalms shift with um, book one, two, three, and four or one, books one, two, three, four, and five. Um, as you progress in the Psalms, each book has a function. Um, you know, I, and, I, and I think you know, the, way I, the way I learned to shift is first, I learned to feel the tension for when it was time to shift. Next, I look for the gear, similar to the way that we seek and look for God. Three, I identified confidently where to go. I, I understood 
and figured out who God is and I would know, and similarly the way we would know God. Um, fourth, I would trust that I was going in the right direction. I wouldn't just say, hey, there's gear three. I would actually move my, or move my gear there. And then finally, I would celebrate. I would rejoice because I had done what was there. Um, it became second nature. It became a rhythm for me. And if you're familiar with manual cars, you, you'll know that manual transmission cars, that most of the time there's kind of a, there's a drawing or something on there for you to be able to shift into it. And that's the way I think about Psalms as I was getting, as I was digging into it is here's a pattern. Here's a paradigm for how we are to praise um, God through song and poetry. Um, funny enough, I, I honestly didn't see the, the little white uh, drawing on my manual shifter. I just learned to do it. It's kind of oblivious, but nonetheless, we had the potential, I think, as Christians to walk around as if God has not given us everything that we need to engage and approach, and approach him. The Psalms, out of all 66 books, it's the one that's most directed towards, um, say for maybe Song of Solomon, I hear um, Dan might, might, might do that for us later, but um, uh, <laughs> say for Song of Solomon, it's the most vivid in terms of poetry and, and, and singing. Um, and God expects us to use it because it's God's word. Um, it's, this, is, this is God's word. And so um, I wanted to encourage you to, to take a second look at the Psalms, to orient yourself and say like, hey, here are words from a sinner to a savior that I can use to approach God. Um, Psalms is our real time call to worship. Um, it's as I would affectionately call it, our gear shifter. Um, I pray that you will shift gears even as we exit out of quarantine and into um, the next season of life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for um, your word. Thank you, God, that you give us something that allows us to feel, to seek, to know, to trust, and to rejoice in you. Thank you, God, for um, your word, for it's a lamp to our, our feet and a light to our path. God, I pray that if anyone here does not know you, um, God, that they would honestly drop to their knees to know you, um, God, and to, and to relate to you through this great book. For those of us, God, that do know you, um, God, I pray that we would not just know you, God, but that we would trust you. God, there are so many distractions. There's so many things in the world that can draw us away from um, from you, God, that want our attention, that beckon for our attention. And God, I pray that we would use this book as our playbook. We'd use it as our psalm book to not just um, read, but to sing and to, and to relate to you through poetry um, and through song. Lord, we love you. We love your church, and we love the things, God, that you're doing in our heart. And we pray, God, that we would be godly men and women in how we respond. Amen. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Praise God. I, I won't make you sing again. Um, I've, I've loved uh, this series about um, the Old Testament. I think it's been helpful. I hope it's been helpful for you. It's, it's been an encouragement to me. And thank you, Michael, for all your work. You guys wouldn't know this necessarily, but... Michael literally went through every single psalm in preparation and wrote his own summary and then compiled each of those. So this is, this is born out of a whole lot of work. Um, I just want to honor him for the hard work that he put into that. Thank you for doing that, man. Um, so we're going to transition now into a time of small groups. Uh, we won't have a ton of time for that, but you guys can just get together and pray with each other. Um, <laughs> let me address it. What, what Michael was referencing about Song of Solomon... Uh, <laughs> After, so next week, Jesse is going to come and he's going to give us an overview of the book of Proverbs. Uh, the week after that, I'm going to do something that I'm still formulating. <laughs> and then uh, the following week, uh, there's going to be like a, a Q&A uh, with a handful of folks uh, on the Old Testament. Uh, after that, we're going to spend four or five weeks talking about different kind of life stages, singleness, friendship, uh, dating, marriage, that kind of thing. Because uh, I, I know that that's something you guys are thinking about. Uh, we're all thinking about it at different points in different ways. So 
Um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit and I'll lead us through that. And, and when we talk about marriage, we will probably look at the book of Song of Solomon because it's an amazing poem about marriage. So that's, that's what that's about. I'm not going to subject you to like a 10 week study in the book of Song of Solomon. <laughs> that's not what's happening. <laughs> um, okay. So that's it. So well, let's split up now uh, into groups. You can just find a spot to sit around this room or you can go in the hallway or, or actually no, is the, is the service still going on over there? Do you know? They left. Okay. Yeah. So if you guys want to go in the hallway, then, then you can go in the hallway or sit outside or something. So uh, thank you guys for being here this evening. Uh, go ahead and get up and stretch. Get up and stretch. Nice long sermon. Just, just stretch your legs after it. It's good. And uh, we will see you guys tomorrow night uh, at the Chateau. 6 p.m. for dinner. See you then.